So good morning, everybody. I hope uh, you are all doing very well today on this Friday morning. So today we'll talk about the Hartley-Fock theory. We will derive Hartley-Fock equations using a combination of the Thales theorem and uh, diagrammatic methods. Um, and um, you know, if there's some time left, uh, I may start talking about the Brachner uh, orbitals, the orbitals which is sometimes referred to as the maximum overlap uh, orbitals. Okay, so in the Hartley-Fock theory, uh, as you know, we are interested in looking for the best Slater determinant. We're going to call it a phi. Best Slater determinant that minimizes the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, which I write here as E phi tilde, placing phi tilde in inside the square bracket. So I'm now writing the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. And in the Hartley-Fock theory, we are interested in minimizing this expression over all determinants phi tilde to produce the optimal determinant phi. In other words, if I compute the energy for, or the energy functional written for phi tilde equal to phi, then this is simply formally defined as the minimum of the energy functional phi tilde over all determinants phi tilde. I use the word functional. Okay, not a function, functional on purpose. Uh, I'm sure that you've heard this term before. Let me just remind you what it is because we'll be so using. Look for it in the dictionary. Yes, I will. I guess I will not. Right. Uh, um, anyway, we will. Uh, I, I want to emphasize on the fact that we're talking about energy functional here because we'll be using techniques of calculus of variations to minimize. So functionals, you know, you know, the function in mathematics means a prescription essentially how to assign a number to a number. Okay? Well, functional means a prescription that tells you how to assign a number to a function. You know, of course, in mathematics there is plenty of this stuff. Uh, you know, you want to know the length of the curve. Okay? Well, that's the number that you are assigning to a curve. Curve is a function. Right? If I want to know the area below the curve, okay? Well, that's you know that you obtain by integrating the, the function, right? you again assign a number, the area, to a function. Uh, and of course in physics we have a lot of this as well. The, one of the famous ones is the famous action integral, right? In classical mechanics, that is behind the Hamilton least action principle. Uh, and of course uh, then you have all kinds of functionals in field theory. We have them uh, also in density functional theory. That word functional appears in DFT and as you know probably 80% of all the calculations in the world nowadays are done in various areas of many of the theory are done with DFT. Okay, so this is an important word. Okay, so that means that we'll be uh, using techniques of the calculus of variations to minimize this functional. All right, and the process of minimizing this functional over all determinants phi tilde will lead to Hartley-Fock equations. Hartley-Fock equations are the equations are a system of equations for the spinorials for the that define the optimum determinant phi. Okay, so that's what they really are. And now, um, you must have seen Hartley-Fock equations, and you, as you know, um, the traditional derivation of these equations is based on the, the following idea. You essentially want to use this typically techniques of first quantization, one doesn't even use second quantization because this is not necessary here. You know, you write the energy expression, which we actually already know how it looks like, assuming that the Hamiltonian has the z, one body part, and the v, the two body part, we know that this energy expression, assuming that phi tilde is normalized, is a sum of the of matrix elements i, z, i, where i's are occupied in phi tilde, plus one half sum over i and j, i, j, v, i, j, anti-symmetrized, um, where again, i, i and j here, that you're summing over are spin orbitals occupied in phi tilde. So we know this expression, and all you need to do is to minimize this expression with respect to spin orbitals 
i and j in this expression subject to the requirement that spin orbitals that you're optimizing must remain orthonormal in the process of, 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 of optimization, and which can be done by adding here uh, constraints with the help of Lagrange multipliers, you know, a standard constraint search of calculus that, uh, that uh, we would normally do. I'm not going to be doing this, okay? We'll, have a, we'll follow here a different recipe, that is, we will try to search in our space of determinants using Fowler's theorem. So our determinants phi tilde defined in our search will be written as the exponent of the single excitation or one ball, one part one ball excitation operator, E C1, acting on the optimum determinant phi. So please remember, phi is my optimum determinant I'm looking for, and I'm going to generate all the other determinants around it by applying Fowler's theorem. Of course, this means that this is already a constrained search. It's not a search over all determinants, okay? Because we know in Fowler's theorem, we know that the overlap of phi and phi tilde here is non zero. Okay, but of course, you know, if you think logically about it, there's no point for me to consider determinants which are orthogonal to the one I'm looking for. Okay? You know, they will, you know, so I'm gonna be looking about, you know, I'm really interested in searching over determinants which have something in common with the phi. And the something in common here means the non-zero overlap. Okay, so that in, you know, and we know that C1 is um, one by the operator, you are summing here over A and I, where I are occupied in phi, A's are unoccupied in phi, <coughs> and we have the matrix elements A, C1, little c1, I, X, A dagger, X, I, which of course you can also write in the normal product form. That's uh, okay, the way it is. So in other words, the process of finding the optimum determinant is the process of finding the optimum C1, or really the factor of finding the optimum coefficients little c that are there, right? So this is how you know you can think about the problem. We'll be varying these c's, these amplitudes here, okay, around the phi, okay, and this will lead to a condition, some sort of a condition that tells us what the optimum spin uh, uh in the determinant phi must be. So. Uh, well, let's uh, then formulate our problem. So our functional then, E phi tilde, I have another blackboard here. I'm going to use that one. So E phi tilde is, when I insert uh, the Fowler's theorem expression into our energy functional, then we end up with phi e to the c1 dagger, okay, um, you know, I will, if you are okay, I will drop these hats, okay, because I'll be writing C1 many times, let's agree that we know that C1 means an operator, so e to the C1 dagger, h e to the C1, that's the numerator of our energy expression, and then in the denominator we have phi e to the C1 dagger e to the C1 phi. This is a capital case, C1, I hope it's clear. Big enough. OK, all right? So what we want to do now, we want to minimize this expression with respect to C1, or the amplitude defined. OK? Now, let's see, how are we going to do this? Well, this is where we're in talking about functionals. Uh, let me remind you, how would you do a search for the minimum in a standard calculus. In a standard calculus, what you have to do, you look at, say, a function, let's assume you have a function of, I don't know, n variables, and if someone asks you to minimize it, okay, all you do is you simply compute first derivatives with respect to the variables that you have there, okay, and you set them at zero. And that gives you stationary points, of course, those are not necessarily minima, but that's your first step, okay? Uh, and you know that this condition, when it comes from the requirement, that the infinitesimal differential right, of the function f, which is defined as di f over di xi times dxi, that this is a zero at the stationary point. Okay? Well, we can take a different view of this. We can also think it in this way. If x0 is my stationary point, so x0, 1 through x0, n, okay, well then, 
I can write, if I look at the difference between fx, where x here means all these variables, x1 through xn, minus f at x0, if I use Taylor expansion, assuming that x is not too far from x0, then we end up with di f over di xi, computed at x equal x0, and you multiply this by x um, i minus x0. Uh, zero i, okay? And then of course we have higher order terms. So the condition that we are at the stationary point, if you analyze the difference between fx and f at x zero, requires that this part is zero because all the partial derivatives here will be zero. So that is telling us that if I want to find the minimum, I really have to look, I really have to zero the leading term in the displacement fx minus fx0, the linear in the displacement of the variables, where, uh, which are relevant to the problem, okay? Well, so let's go back to our calculation. What is that that I have to do here? Well, I have to look at e at some determinant phi tilde, around phi, subtract e at phi, and look, you know, write the corresponding expansion, and look for terms linear in the difference, the displacement of phi tilde minus phi. That's what I really have to do, okay? Um, and then those, those terms linear will define the first variation. We'll use the symbol delta E at <coughs> phi, okay? And we'll simply set the condition, the first variation of our energy functional at the stationary point we're interested in is zero. That's the schematics, okay, that we're going to be following. All right, so what is then, so then how do I identify terms which are linear in phi tilde minus phi? Actually, let's actually, actually analyze what they are. We have Fowler's theorem behind our calculation. So we know that if I want to know what is phi tilde minus phi, maybe I'll use now the arc notation again. This is e to the c1 acting on the phi minus phi. If you, use, if you expand this exponential here, you end up with 1 plus c1 plus 1 half c1 squared and so on, acting on the phi minus phi. You can see that the leading term, 1 times phi, cancels that phi. Okay, so I can simply cross 1 and the phi here. Okay, and then I end up with c1 phi plus various higher order terms. In other words, if you are really interested in the variation of the phi, the determinant itself, that variation is really defined as, an act, as a result of an action of operator C1 on the phi. Okay? So now going back to our optimization of the energy functional, if I want to know what the variation of the energy functional is, I need to identify in it I have to look at the difference of e phi tilde minus e phi, and then identify in it terms which are linear in C1. Okay? Because terms linear in C1 define the variation of the determinant itself. Okay? So that's going to be our uh, first step. So let's start executing this step. I will simply take, consider the difference of the energy function at phi tilde minus the value of e at the optimum determinant phi that we're interested in finding. And now what I have to do, I have to expand the numerator and the denominator here in various powers of C1. Okay? So what I have there is phi 1 plus C1 dagger plus 1 half C1 dagger square and so on. Move this line a little bit higher. Okay, uh, and so on. Then we have the Hamiltonian. And then we have 1 plus C1 plus 1 half C1 squared, and so on, from e to the C1. And then you have to close it with a phi. This is the numerator. What is the denominator? Similarly, you're going to end up with phi, then we have 1 plus c1 plus 1 half c1 squared, and so on. 
times, and of course with the daggers, because that comes from the graph, from the E to the C1 dagger. And then we have 1 plus C1 plus 1 half C1 squared, and so on, from E to the C1, and again closing with the cat phi. So this is the E phi tilde in our representation, and then I have to subtract E at phi. All right. Well, let's work it out a little bit more. So, you know, I mean, I'll make a very long line here, I'm writing all these different <laughs> terms. I will just expand the numerator. Okay, so you end up with the leading term is phi, pick up one from here, pick up one from here, so it's going to be phi h phi. The expectation value of the Hamiltonian in the phi. Okay, well then, we'll have terms such as phi, C1 dagger H phi. This is when I pick up C1 dagger here and one there. And its companion term phi H C1 phi, where I pick up now one from here and C1 from here. Okay? And then of course I could write other terms, but I will not. Because we're not interested in terms which have higher powers of C1 in them. So I'll just say that there's a lot of terms here which have higher powers of C1 than linear, that means that we can write them as, say, the quantity on the order of C1 squared. By that I mean terms which are bilinear in C1, quadratic, and so on, and higher. Okay? And that's enough for us to see. Let's, and in the same way, I'll process the denominator. So what we have in it is phi, inner product of the phi, that's the leading term, and then we have phi, C1, dagger phi, plus phi, c1 phi, and again, all kinds of other higher order terms which contain higher powers of c1 than 1, okay? So I'll just say that this is a quantity on the order of c1 squared, symbolically. Of course, this O and that O is not the same thing, right? I'm not going to bother with some O primes or O double primes and so on. Let's not worry about that. We know what the difference is. And then I have to subtract E at phi. Okay, that's where we are. Okay, well, let's uh, simplify these things a little bit further. So, we are computing, as you know, we're computing end to energy difference, phi tilde, E at phi tilde minus E at phi. And then we have, in the numerator, we have, I guess I have to just rewrite it, phi h phi plus phi. A, uh, phi, uh, C1 dagger uh, H phi plus phi H C1 <coughs> phi plus terms which are quadratic in C1 and higher. Okay? And then in the denominator we have to, you know, we can make some simplifications. First of all, let me go back for a second. Phi is, a, we are assuming that phi, our optimum determinant, is normalized to unity. Phi tildes in our representation are not, because we're really using Taylor's theorem, okay? We are using inter, the intermediate normalization, but this is not a concern, because in our definition of the uh, energy functional, we're dividing by the norm of phi tilde, okay? So there's no issue here in that, that we are using determinants that are suddenly uh, not appropriate, okay? So in any case, going back, that means that this is one, that's one thing we can already write, but there's more. You know, when you apply C1, for example, here to the phi, you end up with singly excited determinants, which are all orthogonal to the phi. So this expression is actually zero. Okay? Similarly here. Okay? Which means that the denominator actually is one plus terms which are at least quadratic in C1. Okay, so that's the uh, first sort of observation. So I'm going to now write, go back to what I was writing, and I will say this is 1 plus terms, which are at least quadratic in C1, or bilinear, I should say, you know, because of C1, C1 factor. Okay? And then I have to subtract E at phi. Okay, because we're looking for this difference. <coughs> well, now, we have, you know, we have to do something about this expression. Well, you know, obviously, you know, when we're searching, you know, over the determinants around the phi, we don't really have to go 
very far from this place, from the stationary point. We're looking at a round field, which means that we can simply make an assumption that this is a small term. That is, I'm not really, I don't really have to worry about amplitude C1 becoming so big that this term on the order of C1 squared is large, larger than 1, okay, altogether. So, um, and then you know, you know that in math, if I have an expression of the type 1 over 1 plus x, that's what we have here, and if the absolute value of x is less than 1, you can expand it in a, convert, in a Taylor series, you'll get 1 minus x and then some higher return. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to replace this denominator expression by the numerator part, focusing on the leading terms only, because we're really interested, remember, we're not interested in all the terms, we're just interested in the leading terms. Okay, well, what, what, will, what, what is this going to give you? E phi delta minus E phi equals, so now I have the numerator, phi h phi plus phi c1 dagger h phi plus phi h c1 phi, those are the three terms we had there, plus a quantity which has c1 squared or higher the terms, let's maybe put this in square brackets, and then times, I'm replacing 1 over 1 plus O by 1 minus O, okay? So it is uh, 1 minus a quantity which has C1 squared or higher powers of C1. Of course, as a reminder, this O and that O is not the same thing. Obviously, right? They originate from different sources. But they, I am not just interested in knowing what are powers of, the C, of C1 in them. You know, if I now work it out, and then I would like to subtract E phi. So when I work it out, maybe I'll do it on a different blackboard, go back to our original blackboards. We obtain the following. E at phi tilde minus E at phi is well, the leading term, first there will be three terms, maybe I should say, right away. There will be, if you're looking for terms which are linear in C1, this, this, and this are terms which do not contain higher powers than C1, uh, than C1, okay? So, and then you multiply it by 1, all right? So this, so the first three terms in our expression are phi h phi plus phi C1 dagger h phi plus phi h c1 phi. Okay, and then the question is, do I have to write more? Well, not really, because if I multiply each of these three terms by this one, that's already quadratic in c1, or bilinear c1, okay? And that's not of, our, of interest to us. So I'm not going to even try. And this is, of course, c1 squared or higher, if I multiply this by anything here, I also end up with terms which are quadratic or higher. So I really can summarize all of this by saying that what, is, what, is, what else is here can all be wrapped up by saying O C1 squared, quantities which are bilinear in C1 or higher. Okay? And then, so this is what comes out from the E at phi tilde, okay? And then we have to subtract E at phi. But if you go back to our definitions, what is E at phi? E at phi, that's simply an expectation value of the Hamiltonian, phi h phi, divided by the inner product of phi with itself. We are assuming that phi is normalized to unity. So this is 1, meaning that the energy computed at phi cancels the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. Okay? So this and this goes away. All right? So in other words, our leading terms are phi c1 dagger h phi plus phi h c1 phi. And then, of course, we have a bunch of terms which are bilinear c1 or higher. Okay? So, how, what is then the variation, the quantity we're interested in, the first variation of E at phi, meaning the term, term linear in c1, those two. That's our variation. We have now identified it, and as you can see, we did it with the help of the fantastic Taoist theorem. This is our variation. 
okay? And we are supposed to now set the condition on it in order to the fact, you know, the assumption that phi is an optimal determinant means that this variation is zero, okay? Which implies that these two terms produce a zero. Well, if they are zero, you know, you can clearly see that this also can be written as Move it up a little bit. This can be written as phi, C1 dagger H phi, plus a complex conjugate of the first term. Okay, so let's move this now up. Let's start with the final part of the derivation of the hard point equation. So, what we have here is a condition that this term plus its complex conjugate give you zero. Now, uh, if C1 is real, then of course you know you just have to double one of these two terms. And you know, since we're varying over all C1s, you know, that uh, of course you know, you know means that each of these two terms must be zero then. Okay? If there if C1 is complex, we are really not necessarily interested in having complex ones. But even if we were then there are two we have two linearly independent terms. So in other words, the condition that this is zero independent of C1, because that's how you have to read it. This is zero independent of what C1 is. That condition means that each of these two terms, phi C1 dagger H phi, is zero, and so is phi H C1 phi. Okay? For all C1s. Well, you know, from our derivation for all C1s, which are not too big, because at some point we made an assumption that these amplitudes cannot be too big, so that, but you know, but that's not really important. Um, okay. So I'm going to pick up on this condition, okay? That, you know, because one of them is enough to finish the processing. And this is the point where we now start using second quantization. Uh, first of all, let's make an assumption that phi, our optimal determinant, defines the Fermi vacuum. Okay? All right. Phi will serve now, in our calculations, as a Fermi vacuum. <coughs> okay? Well then, I can always represent the Hamiltonian as a sum of two terms. The Hamiltonian in the normal product form, relative to the Fermi vacuum, plus the expectation value of the Hamiltonian in the Fermi vacuum. Okay? Furthermore, we know from our previous classes that Hn equals the sum of two terms. I'm assuming that the Hamiltonian contains only uh, two body interactions. Of course, if you had more, then you would have various three body and higher order terms. That wouldn't really change the essence of our consideration. So I'm going to focus on H being Z, one body part, plus V, a pairwise interaction term. So what we have is Fn, as you remember, plus Vn. And what are these? Well, Fn is a one-body operator, sum over PQ, P little f q, normal product of x, p dagger, x q, where these matrix elements, P, F, Q, are defined as follows. We have P little z, q, so that's just the one-body part of the real Hamiltonian that we're using, uh, the matrix element uh, of it, plus a summation uh, plus the, you know, the G term. I write it actually explicitly right away. So we have a summation over, say, J going from 1 to N, and we have here P, J, V, Q, J, anti-symmetrized, okay? That's the GN part of F, N, okay? And I already talked about it. I said that this is really nothing else than sort of an attempt to scatter P into the Q, right, in the presence of all the J's, that is, in the presence of the mean field. So that's a mean field term, and we'll talk about it some more today. Okay? And then Vn, of course, you know, we've seen it so many times that maybe I'm, I'm wasting time writing it again, but let's have it for completeness. So PQ, V, R, S, okay, I can leave it as it is, uh, normal product of X, P dagger, X, uh, are, okay, x to the letter xs. Let's have it this way. All right? 
So now what we have is this. So what I'm going to do now is in my next step, I will take this form of the Hamiltonian and write it into our condition that has that has emerged from our derivations uh, uh, aiming aimed at hard defined quiz. Okay, so let's uh, we do it on this platform. So when you insert our decomposition of the Hamiltonian into the condition resulting from the first variation of energy being zero, we end up with phi C1 dagger. And then for H, I will write H n plus expectation value of H. <coughs> okay? And this has to be zero. So I'm going to say maybe here that this has to be zero, independent of C1. OK, so if I split this into two components that we have here, we have phi HN, sorry, phi C1 dagger HN phi. That's the first term. And then the second term will be a product of the expectation value of the Hamiltonian in phi times phi, you can see here, it's going to be phi, C1 dagger, phi. But that is a zero again. Because C1 is an excitation operator, okay, so when you apply it using turn overall, for example, in this direction, you produce single excited excited determinants, which are orthogonal to the phi. So I can say that this term is zero, not because of this part, but because of the C1 part. Okay, so as you can see, we're just left with this. This has to be zero. But Hn is Fn plus Bn. So then our condition really is as follows. Phi C1 dagger Fn phi plus phi C1 dagger Vn phi is zero. I replace Hn by Fn plus Vn. Okay? Well, this is the, the, we're now at the point where we can start using diagrams to figure out these two expressions. Well, let's start with this one. First of all, what is C1 diagrammatically, or C1 diagram? Well, C1 itself, as you remember, was defined as the sum over AI, A, little C1I, XA dagger, XI, maybe I'll emphasize in the normal Clark form, really, because that's what they are, okay? We are interested in, not in C1, in this expression, we're interested in C1 dagger. So what is C1 dagger then? Sorry, this is not properly clean yet. Okay, so what is C1 dagger? C1 dagger is a summation over AI. We have to take complex joints of H elements AC1I. So I'm going to put an asterisk here. And then you have a normal product of XI dagger XA. So if you're really looking for a diagrammatic representation of what is C1, okay, well then C1 will be a diagram like this, right? We already actually had diagrams of this sort before. You know, you have some sort of a vertex. I'm going to write it as an open circle. We have <coughs> A that comes in and I that is leading, okay? And we know that the scalar factor for it is this. Okay, that's going to be the scalar factor associated with this vertex when we start computing. So let's look at this term first. Well, then I have C1 dagger here. And Vn, of course, I can just do a full house representation here, PQRS. And I am supposed to form resulting diagrams with no external lines. Because I'm computing expectation value in the feed. Well, I can't do it. Because I have four lines here, two of them there. Cannot produce a non-zero. Diagram. So that means that this thing here, if I compute the expectation value of it, that's a zero. Okay? No need to talk about it any further. Okay? So what is really left is this term here, the one that contains Fn. Okay? That's the term we want to focus on. Alright, so let's uh, let's try to do it. Once 
say, so we are now going to be looking at expectation for C1 diagram Fn. So again, diagram updated. What do we have there? We have a diagram for C1 dagger. And we, have, we must also produce a diagram for Fn. I guess, uh, I hope I'll be consistent for the rest of this class. Fn will be a one, this is a one body vertex. Okay? So we have P and Q here. It's a normal product, so I think for normal product, we always use dotted lines or something like this. And you know, I have to hang some symbol at it. I'm gonna hang a little circle, or a little dot, right? Because I think I already used the cross. I believe I used the cross in the circle. So I guess uh, that's gonna be the next uh, one body pair, okay? It doesn't really matter uh, for what we're gonna do with it, okay? And I am interested in forming resulting diagrams with no external lines. Well, you can see, I promised you only one diagram, and there you have it. There isn't much more that you can do with it. It's just this picture. That's the whole hardy theory. Okay? It's that simple. This must be then zero, right? Because this is our condition. Right? So what we need to do now is to read this diagram. Okay, well, let's follow our, you know, protocol, our rigorous protocol. The weight of it, you tell me what it is. One. one. That's right. Sine is minus one to how many loops? One. one. How many internal whole lines? One. one. So it's a plus. Okay? And the rest is just forming the product of scales. Okay, there's no operator part, it's a, it's a closed loop. So, what we have is a summation over A and I. Remember, A and I here are free. Maybe I should re-emphasize this here, because P and Q are also free. All right? Remember our C, because we're talking about C1, not a projection on the single excited, single excited terminal, but we're talking about C1, the real operator. Okay? So we have sum over A, I, and now we have to form a product of matrix elements. The matrix elements for the C1 dagger, it's there, still in the box. It is A, C1, I, with an asterisk, the complex conjugate, right? And then, for this one, it's an outgoing line A, fog operator, fog operator here, that's an operator behind this vertex, I. And this has to be zero, okay? Remember, this has to be zero for all values of the C1 coefficients. Okay? <coughs> this must be true for all A, C1, I. Okay? Of course, you know, again, strictly speaking, within certain range from zero. Okay? But certainly it's detrimental. Well, if this expression is zero for all values of these coefficients, that means that all these coefficients here must be zero for every A and for every I. Okay? Is this clear? You know, it's a linear combination of some terms gives you zero for all values of the coefficients and to the linear combination. Of the only way to out of it is to assume that these terms here must be zero. So this means that we now produce, well, this is very important condition, so I guess it deserves a separate blackboard. We now proved by drawing a single diagram that the condition for phi to be a stationary point, hopefully a minimum, is A, our operator F, that originates from the normal ordering. Remember where F came from. F in our class came out of normal ordering ideas, okay? So A, F, I must be zero for every I occupied in phi and for every A unoccupied in phi. Alright? Well, let's try to understand what, what is the meaning of this statement. This statement means that F acting on I is orthogonal to A. Okay? That is a symbol for orthogonal. Okay? Orthogonal in the sense of inverse space. All right, now, if F acting on I is orthogonal to all unoccupied states, this means that F acting on I must be a linear combination of occupied states. 
Okay? Because there are two complementary spaces. So F acting on I is a linear combination with some coefficients that I will call lambda J I of the occupied space J in the determinant. And this is the famous system of Hartree Fock equations. The one of whether we obtain in the way I described. Okay? The Fock operator acting on, uh, on the, one of the states occupied in it, uh, uh, in, in the Hartree Fock theorem, gives you a linear combination of, of, of uh, uh, single particle states occupied in the determinant. Okay, with some coefficients lambda. So it's a system of equations, because of course this is true for i equal 1 through n. Okay? So this is a system of equations, n equations, where you have to solve for spin orbitals i and coefficients lambda j i. These coefficients lambda j i actually have a meaning, it's very easy to see because of orthogonality, or also normality of our states, but they are simply matrix elements of the fog operator. Okay? So if I give you what fog operator, then you know exactly what the lambdas are. Okay? But of course we have to find them in the process of solving. Alright? So now the thing is that I would like to spend some time trying to interpret this result. I think this is a good time maybe for a little break. Okay? And then after the break, we'll make a comparison of this with what we know about hard to work theory in a conventional presentation of it that relies on first quantizations, you know, the core of the presentation techniques. Okay? All right, so let's have uh, the five minute, uh, nine twenty. Start at five minutes late. So let's, uh, and then we'll continue. <laughs> divided by phi, phi. Phi is normalized to unity, right. so the denominator is 1. So that means that E at phi is okay. phi so h phi. Okay. So that's what happens here. Right? We see the same term written twice. Phi h phi is the same as E phi, so they do cancel out. Okay. okay? So, yeah, so you can make a remark that this is E phi, if you like, or this is, you can make a remark that E phi is phi h phi. Yeah, I'm looking previous, so I guess I. So that makes sense. But where does this go? Something else that uh, is left over, or? Yeah. Well, from the previous term, we have this minus this. Yes. And then here we have this expression minus this. So we have a minus e p on each side. Okay. Oh, that's what that's why I'm confused. Is that we have? I I see that these will cancel, but we have two. These terms over here, over here. Oh no, no, because this one comes from here. This one comes from here. It comes from oh, the oh, oh, Yeah, okay. you see it's here? It's all over the place. If, yeah. you, start, if you go go back, it's not, that's the term we have. You know, this is, you know, if you I don't know what is your order of your page. So with the previous page to this one. Yeah, okay, here. You see if you go scale back, you know, start from the beginning. Yeah, here. You start like this, right? right. You just start using the right. power series functions. Right. And then you start expanding. So you have 1, H, 1. So it's going to be this one. Yeah, I see that. And then you have the other ones. Now, this is your PHP. That you, we continue copying. PHP here, right. PHP oh, here. Right. Okay, so that's the PHP. It comes from E phi tilde. Yes. The other one is With the here. one at the end. Yeah, and those two cancel out. They will cancel out. Yeah, like you did. Okay, so this PHP originates oh, okay. from E phi tilde. And we preserve this because this, this goes to this. Yeah, because so the difference, that makes sense. Yeah, we, that makes in, sense. in defining the first variation, we are looking for the leading term in the difference which is linear in C1. That makes sense. Yeah? Okay. Okay. I thought that this was, this continues all the way around. I thought that this was, it was like this. Oh, no, no. I had switched. Uh, okay. Well, right. So is it now? Yeah. Right? Okay. 
So I'll send you a message about it, but, but we found with Rachel, uh, that we found the uh, room for the exam, okay? So uh, I'll send a message, of course, and everybody will have a chance to comment if need be. Uh, but uh, what uh, she found is uh, a room in Crow, uh, 205, so for people in physics, yeah, that's a good location, I guess, for us, it means a little bit of walking. Uh, all right, and it is April 13th, as we agreed, and uh, she found a room between 4 and 7 p.m., which I think kind of matches everybody's requirements. Some people said after one, some people said after two, some people say don't start too late. Okay, I hope uh, starting at four is okay. It's from four to seven. Of course, the exam is really for two hours, right? And it is possible that uh, you'll be gone by six, right? Because you, you know, you'll be very well prepared, as I'm sure you will, and for uh, will just stop, not have to wait. But I, you know, reserve it for the next hour in case people want to keep writing, checking, double checking, verifying, whatever, right? So that we're not pressed for that. Is that okay? All right. You know, that's a nice thing about this campus. For me, you know, kind of, and I'm assuming, you know, walking into a different building is not necessarily the easy thing to do. It's just a huge campus right here. Going to Crow is a nice walk. This way, the very pleasant. So, so that's, uh, that's what I'm doing. But anyway, I'll send a message to everybody, okay, confirming this information. All right, so we're just slowly start writing. All right, so what we want to do really now is this. We derive these equations from Taurus theorem. Okay. Um, the question is, are these, you know, and remember our fog operator here emerged from the normal ordering. So the question now is, are these really the well-known hard fog equations that you normally derive using conventional means, that is, a coordinate representation and first quantization. So what is that you obtain in a traditional presentation? In a traditional presentation, you obtain the following set of equations. So you write, you have, a, you have an operator called the Fock operator, which is a one fermion operator, okay? You act with it on a spin orbital of phi, okay? X here means, you know, X, Y, Z, and the spin coordinates uh, of a fermion, uh, maybe I. And you end up with a sum over J from 1 to N, where N is the number of fermions, lambda J I, phi J I, X. Okay? So you, have, you end up with a system like this in a conventional presentation. In this... Uh, in, the com in a conventional presentation, the lambdas actually have a very specific meaning. They are Lagrange multipliers that you, are, you have to introduce in the constraint search when you minimize the expectation value of the Hamiltonian over all spin orbitals with constraints that all these spin orbitals have to remain orthonormal in the process of optimization. You use Lagrange multipliers, and those lambdas are really the Lagrange multipliers. 
So they all have a meaning, a specific meaning in the final calculation. All right, and then F in a conventional presentation consists of essentially three contributions. There is the Z, that of course comes from the original Hamiltonian. Then you have the so-called Coulomb operator, okay? And then you will subtract the exchange operator. Okay? Z of doesn't need really many, a lot of explanations, but uh, I will now define the J and the K. Okay? So what is J? The Coulomb operator is defined as it's a multiplicative operator, <coughs> and the internal kernel for it is an integral of phi j star x prime here, v x x prime, phi j x prime. So x prime means, you know, the variable I'm integrating over, okay? You form this expression, you integrate over x prime, and then when I want to know how the Coulomb operator operates on some function, so maybe I'll add here, create more space for it. If I want to know how this operator acts on some function, that's how we define operators. We have to know how they act. See, so if I want to know how it acts on some function, say psi. Okay, what I do is I form this integral, sum it over j, from 1 to n, and multiply by psi. That's all there is to it. So the meaning of it is what this part is, sum over j, this integral simply is the effective potential created by all occupied spin orbitals, and then simply you are applying this effective potential, this part here, to a function. It's a simple multiplicative of operator. Well, what about the exchange part? Of course, you know, we say Coulomb, you know, because historically these things, you know, uh, originated from calculation the electronic structure, right, then V would be 1 over R12, right, uh, in the, in a sort of, in a molecular, uh, or atomic problem. Okay. What is the exchange operator? Again, if I want to know how exchange acts on a function, what I do, I do the following. We write an integral over the variables x prime, we have phi j star x prime. We have v x x prime, so a pairwise interaction. And then you perform an exchange. You know, that term exchange actually comes from what I'm going to do now. You take your function, you move it inside the integral, you take the function here, you expel it outside. Okay? That's the exchange of those two. That's what this operator really does. So that means that I will end up with psi x prime. So now we are integrating psi with the rest of this expression. Okay? And then you multiply this result by phi j x, which you put outside. Okay? And then, of course, you sum over j from 1 to n. Okay? And, of course, this is a consequence of the fact that we are using fermions, we have fermions here, so we have slightly determinants, that is, we have anti-symmetrization, and that anti-symmetrization leads to exchanges, right? If you didn't, if you replace the slightly determinant by a simple product of spin orbitals with no anti-symmetrization in it, this would be the so-called Hartree product, and then we would not have exchange terms, okay? We would just have the Coulomb part, okay? We would end up with the so famous Hartree equations, right? Which were, of course, solved in the 30s and so forth, right? With some sort of cranky machines, you know. Not computer. All right. Anyway, fantastic work was already done at that time. Okay. But exchange, of course, is an important consequence of, of the Fermion statistics. Okay. So anyway, that's what the definitions are. So of course, now I would like to convince you or me, right, that this really is the same operator that we obtained from the laundry. The best way to do it is just to compute matrix elements of this f. So what is then p f q? Where now f means this f, the one that comes from the traditional uh, presentation. Well, of course, you end up with p z q. That was obvious from the beginning. And then I have to compute matrix elements of the Coulomb and exchange operators. p j q plus sorry, sorry minus p k 
Okay. Okay. What? Well, let's do it. So let's compute the first one. P J Q equals. Well, what I have here is I have to form an integral of phi p star x, the Coulomb operator, acting on phi q x. And I want to integrate this over x, so maybe I'll keep writing these dx's in front. Okay, that's what I need to do. Now I have to apply the definition of j. Okay, so what do we have there? Uh, let's start with the integration part, summation will add in there. Okay, so I'm integrating there over dx prime. Okay? Then I have phi, then I have phi j x prime. I will leave some space here and I put phi j x prime with an asterisk. So I'm picking up pairs from the definition. Then I have the v. Then I have phi j x prime. Again, I'll leave some space here and I'll put phi j x prime. Okay? So that's what comes from the Coulomb operator's definition. Alright? This part. Now I do the following. Maybe I'll use now X on the color. I need phi p, so I'll stick it here, star x, and I need phi q <coughs> x, right? Because it's a multiplicative operator. So when you apply it to phi q, you really multiply by phi q. Okay? That's what all I'm doing. Right? So those are these two. And now you have to integrate it over x. And then you have to sum it over j. Okay? That's what comes up. When you read what it is, it is simply a matrix element. P, J, you can see. First fermion, second fermion. First fermion, second fermion. So this is P, J, Q, J. Okay? Well, so far so good. Let's then check on the exchange then. What is then a matrix element of P exchange operator Q? Once again, I'll start writing from the definition of the, of the K operator. So we have an integral over X prime. We have phi J, I'll leave some space here, phi J X prime with an asterisk. Okay, so I'm, you know, I'm, maybe I'll move this up a little bit. I'm right here, then I have V. And now I have to be careful, right? Because what I need to do, I need to perform this exchange. Meaning that, in our case, I have phi q in front of the k operator, okay? Because you have to remember that this is, did I write it? I think I did it. So this is simply an integral of phi p star x k phi q x integrated over x. Okay? That's what I need to do. So I need to really apply k to phi q, which means that now, what has to happen is that phi q has to end up inside the integral. Okay, so you'll have phi q x prime. All right, that's what it has to happen because you're applying to phi q. That's uh, like applying here to psi. Psi ended up inside, so phi q has to end up inside. Okay, and now you have to, I have to fill the blanks. So I'm going to have phi p x. That's this one. And then. As you know, in this process of exchange, phi j is knocked out, it goes outside. All right? So I'm going to have phi, I'm going to have phi j here, x. Okay? Normally it would be there, but I want to write these uh, various components such that x is always be written before the x prime. Okay? So that's what the exchange is. So you have to integrate this over x. And you have to sum over j from 1 to n. And if you really, again, read this carefully, you have an integral here over x prime and x. Okay? So we have fir fir first fermion is x, second fermion is x prime. And when I read what matrix element this is, you can see it's, it is, uh, of course, here I forgot to sum over our story. Okay? So here we are summing over j from 1 to n. Okay? And our matrix elements are p. You know, first fermion, second fermion, first fermion, second fermion. So it's P, J, J, Q. Okay? That's the uh, matrix element of the uh, exchange. 
operator. So you can see that if I combine all of these things together, okay, then the matrix element of the Fock operator that emerges from a conventional presentation, okay, is P Z Q. Then from the column we got sum over J from 1 to N P J V Q J. And from the exchange we got minus P J V J Q. Okay? And of course this is an anti-symmetrized matrix element, P, J, V, Q, J. And this is of course nothing else than the G part, little G part of the FOC operator that we obtained here in this class from normal ordering. So you see we have sort of these two concepts now mer merged together. There's a FOC operator that originates from a conventional presentation of party work theory <coughs> that you end up with such expressions. And this is our FOC operator that we obtained from normal ordering in the Hamiltonian, and you can see they are really the same thing. Okay, which means that indeed what we obtain here are the well-known Hartree-Fock equations. So then, of course, let's take some next step. Well, you know very well that usually we don't write Hartree-Fock equations in the way I did with the lambdas. Okay, normally or here with the lambdas. Normally, when you read some textbooks and people don't go into all the details. Then they tell you that Hartree-Fock equations are fx acting on your spin orbital phi i gives you a little ener the energy e i, which is called you know, you know in case of molecular orbitals that would be molecular orbital energy, right? Or anyway, the energy oscillated with a given single particle state times phi i. Okay. Those are the equations that we often see. Okay, as uh, as a system of Hartree-Fock equations. Actually, specifically, we should call those canonical Hartree-Fock equations. I guess I'll write HF, no hydrogen fluoride, HF for Hartree-Fock. So the question then is, how do you end up here compared to what we had with lambdas? Okay? Well, you know, you always have to remember that we have a lot of flexibility in the determinants. That is, the state determinant will not change if you perform a unity transformation of its spin orbitals. Okay? Spin orbitals will change, but not the determinant. And we're really interested in the determinant in that. We're not interested, you know, in how individual orbitals look like. You know, that is subject to an arbitrary rotation. Okay? So, we can use this flexibility here and prove in a very straightforward manner that our equations, these are the ones I erased, are invariant with respect to arbitrary unitary rotations, unitary transformations of spin orbitals. You know, if the determinant doesn't change, then the equations that define it cannot change either, right? But of course, you can prove it directly. I will not do it. It's such a standard thing to do that. Uh, you can do it yourself, you can read about it, or maybe you have already done it, right? Uh, or, you know, sometime in your undergraduate work, right? So, the thing is that, the point I'm making is that we have a flexibility. Spin orbitals can be rotated in the determinant without changing the determinant, which means that these equations are invariant with respect to unitary transformations of spin orbitals. Well, so how about if I try to use this flexibility? If you look at this, these lambda ji's, or these matrix elements, I write them now as lambda ij, those are matrix elements of a Hermitian operator. F is a Hermitian operator because Z is and V is and so on, right? So everything, this is a Hermitian operator. Well, you know, in other words, I can form a matrix. Let's call it lambda of all these coefficients, right? Lambda ij. So this is rho i column j, okay? I can form a matrix. This matrix is a Hermitian matrix. It's an n by n Hermitian matrix. Well, you know from basic algebra, that every Hermitian matrix can be diagonalized with a unitary transformation. Okay? In other words, I can always take some unitary, I'm going to write it sort of in these blocks, some unitary matrix and transform our matrix of coefficients lambda 
to produce a diagonal matrix where on the diagonal, okay, you will have these epsilon i's, okay, and we will have zeros everywhere else, okay? So maybe, you know, so epsilon 1 and so on, epsilon n, okay? <laughs> this is what I can always do. I can take my original matrix lambda and diagonalize it. The equations will not change. The equations formally, the ones in this box, will not change as a result of this. Because they are invariant with respect to arbitrary unitary transformations. So in particular, they will look the same when I use, when I transform lam, lam, when I transform lambda, and at the same time, if I apply this unitary transformation to transform spin orbitals. Okay? So if I apply a unitary transformation u which diagonalizes lambda to spin orbitals, I will not change equations, I will not change the determinant, okay? But I will end up with a new form. In this form, the all diagonal elements of the transformed lambda matrix, which are called epsilons here, okay, the all, sorry, the all diagonal ones are, will be zero. So the, in other words, in the summation over J, J will have to be equal to I. We'll have to be fixed at I for a given I. Because lambda will be now diagonal, and I will call those the diagonal elements of the transformed lambda the epsilons. Okay? Which means that in this way, I can obtain equations shown here, or if I write them in, in, in our context, maybe I'll do it here, we can also say that after transformation, of course I could put some tildes or so on, I'm not going to do this, let's assume that the i's will be now the transformed ones, okay? F acting on i equals epsilon i acting on i, okay? This is what it is, when i goes from 1 to f. Alright? Those are the canonical. HF equations. Is it clear to you how this is done? It's done using flexibility of our uh, of our determinant. Yeah, we can simply choose the unitary transformation that diagonalizes the matrix of lambdas, okay, and apply the same transformation to our spin orbitals. If we do this, our lambdas become diagonal. I will then call them epsilons, and then we obtain equation in a canonical form where the all diagonal elements, lambda ij, are gone. Okay? And those are the equations we typically see in books, and those are the ones actually we're solving. Okay? Then the question is, how do we solve it? You know, sometimes you hear the term that this is an eigenvalue problem. It's not an eigenvalue problem. See, an eigenvalue problem in mathematics means that you have an operator. So we're trying to do these things here. We have an operator. Say A or something like this. And I have to diagonalize it, meaning that I have to solve for its eigenvalues, okay? And eigenvectors. So G are eigenvectors, lambda is an eigenvalue. That's what you do. But A does not depend on the solution. A is your given operator and you diagonalize it to obtain eigenvalues. Well, here we're not doing this because our fog operator depends on the solution. Okay? If you really think about what was the fog operator, it had this, you know, the G term. The Z part is independent of the solution. But the G part depends on the spin orbitals that we are solving for. In other words, what we are really saying here, we don't have this, we have, we, we don't have this, we have a different problem here. We have a problem that the fog operator is a function of solutions, or a functional. Of solutions, so it is uh, something like a, it's an operator which is a function of solutions. So I'm going to write it maybe p1 through pn. Okay, it's a function of all these solutions. That's how you build it because of the g part, the mean field part. Then you apply it to phi i. So I'm, I'm, I'm switching back to the first quantization. Okay, uh, and then I end up with epsilon i phi i. Okay, this is not an eigenvalue problem. Sometimes we use the term pseudo eigenvalue problem for this. Because the operator we're trying to diagonalize actually depends on the solutions. So you can't solve it using traditional techniques used to solve eigenvalue problems. You have to invoke the procedure called SCF, self-consistent field. I'm sure you've heard that. Well, what is this procedure? 
It's an iterative procedure. You can't solve it in one shot. You have to uh, simply provide some initial guess. Okay, so let me sort of sketch how the SCF procedure will work. You have to provide some initial guess for your spin orbitals. All right, so you start with an initial guess in the first step. This will be simply your spin orbital, so that I'm not going to label them with a zero, like in any initial guess. How do I get the initial guess? Well, it's really an infinite number of possibilities, but the traditional possibilities are you diagonalize the Z, Z is known to you. Z is a kinetic energy, or a kinetic energy and interaction of the external potential in a molecule, all right? So all you need to do is to diagonalize the known operator, and that's this, this, assuming that the cool, the cool of an exchange parts are not too big, that may be a good start. There are other starts. People use semi-empirical Hamiltonians quite often in various quantum chemistry codes, for example, right? That is, you replace your Hamiltonian by actually some sort of an effective Hamiltonian, which is empirical, but it doesn't matter because it's just to get this initial guess. You know, it is not something that you're going to be solving for. You just need some initial start, okay? So that's how you start. What you do with it, you use this initial guess to build your initial approximation of the fog operator. So you simply define F in the zero approximation as the fog operator defined through these initial orbitals. Okay? And now you've got your fog operator that you can diagonalize. This part, this part, you can do using conventional techniques. So you say diagonalize, di diagonalize F0. Okay? So simply you look at the Hartree Fock equations. Okay? <coughs> and you're solving with this form of the fog operator, meaning that you obtain now some approximation or next approximation of the orbitals. So it's going to be our, say, let's call it first iteration. All right? So this, you know, since fog here operator is fixed because it's fixed at this value, well, then of course you can solve this problem. It's an eigenvalue problem now with F0. <coughs> that produces new set of orbitals and the corresponding energies. So then you go to the next step. You construct a new fog operator, a new approximation to it. Let's call it F1, okay, which is a fog operator as you normally define it. Defined through or calculated using the first order approximations to the spin orbitals. Okay? And then again, diagonalize it. Okay, so in other words, you look at the equation, eigenvalue problem. F1 phi i x equals epsilon i phi i x. Of course, the new phi i x is with a measure, I'm going to label them with a 2. Okay, my second iteration. And then you continue, right? You take phi i 2s, construct phi 2, sorry, f2, okay? and solve again, end up with pi 3s and epsilon 3s. And you continue this procedure until you convert. Okay, so then <coughs> continue. Until you converge. How do you recognize convergence? Well, you can monitor two things. You can monitor how the epsilons change, how the orbital energies change. Okay, but that's a weak criteria. The stronger criteria is to monitor the orbitals themselves. How do they change? And you can actually do this by monitoring the norms. They're all normal, you know, you can simply see when the normal, the difference between the new orbitals and the previous orbitals is not too big. You put some numerical threshold, you say, I'm done. Actually, this is not done even in this way. That would be unnecessary. You know, uh, you can easily show that the fog, fog operator is a one-body operator, so it's really representable in terms of the reduced density matrix. Okay, the one-body reduced density matrix, so you can actually monitor the density matrix. Right, simply, you know, and then compute how the matrix the density matrix changes from one iteration to the next. All right? Well, of course, you hope that this converges. It depends on the, on the quality of your initial guess and, and, and so on. Usually, this stuff would not converge, actually. Yeah. All right? So what you do, well, we do already well, you know, after hundreds of iterations, which is a waste of your computer time. All right? So what you do is you actually put some additional accelerators on top of this procedure which exists in the literature under the terms 
such as DIIS, which is a direct inversion of the iterative subspace, a very interesting name. And when you, this was done by this was invented by Peter Kulai, famous quantum chemist. Or you can apply a procedure called second order SCF. It's another way of accelerating the convergence, how the acceleration typically works. What you do, you're trying to simply, in addition to the SCF iterations, you also extrapolate the next solution, okay? From the information from the previous iterations. So in other words, you, call, you, you store the previous orbitals from the previous iterations, <coughs> and you are trying to extrapolate the next one from this information in addition to the SCF step, okay? I'm not gonna go into details, but that's how this is done. If you do this, typically hard to can converge now in 10, 20 iterations to extremely good accuracy, you know, uh, pretty much all the digits of that, this is important for energies, okay? That's how good it is nowadays. Of course, you know, sometimes the, you know, one of these fails, you know, the IS fails, you can switch to SOSCF, if that one fails, you can switch back and forth, you know, you can of course do this. <coughs> Various programs do it sometimes automatically when they see that you're going nowhere, they cannot turn to a different algorithm and they try to force, force the convergence. You can also use various denominator shifts, you know, all kinds of things. You can constrain the rotations that is if, if you go from one iteration to the next and if the orbitals want to change too much, you say, no, 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 you dump them with a hammer, you say, don't go too far, okay? Because if you go too far, you may diverge, right? And so on. So, uh, you know, all these uh, plethora of tricks exist. Uh, so today, hard to focus is a bread and butter. Bread and butter. And that means everything else based on hard to including DFT, is bread and butter too. Because, you know, this is the same type of algorithm that you have to solve for, okay? Uh, of course, the details are how we represent orbitals. Well, we typically use basis sets. So spin orbitals you're solving for are represented as linear combinations of some known functions called basis functions. Okay? And that is actually an important aspect now for us. Because as you know, in this class, we're not really extremely interested in hard to as such. Because it's such a simple thing. And, and number two, it is also we are interested here in correlation. We are interested in theories that go beyond mean field, beyond hard to fault. Okay? Those other things, those other determinants. So the thing is then this. What, why are we interested in hard to fault here? Because hard to fault provides a very good basis for performing post hard to fault calculations, kappa cluster, MBPT, what have you. Okay? How is this working? So now this touches the aspect of a basis set. So, if I have spin orbitals, okay, we typically represent them as linear combinations of some known functions. I use some coefficients, say d mu, i, chi, mu, okay, over mu. Those mu's are basis functions. In quantum chemistry, typically, of course, there are many choices again, but typically you would use contracted linear combinations. Each of these kinds would be a linear combination of primitive Gaussians of the S, of the P, of the D, and so on types. Okay, so we talk about the so-called contracted Gaussian orbitals, or contracted C, G, T, O's. Okay, here. So those are known, someone else other than you usually optimize them for you. For chemistry, if you look at the periodic table, every element has multiple basis sets behind it. Okay, so nowadays you go to a website, you click, and the basis set comes out. What is the T? Gaussian type. I think that's what it is, yeah. Or you can have SGOs, slight slate type. Yeah, there's another way to do this, but slate type orbitals are not very popular <laughs> because they lead to intercourse which are hard to calculate. Okay? okay? So we use Gaussians, they are very easy to manipulate because the product of Gaussians is another Gaussian. So when you have a four index quantity like a matrix element of the V, you know the product of Gaussians on each side will be another Gaussian. So you end up with just instead of four Gaussians, you have just two now. Okay, well that's easier to calculate. So you know, and then for Coulomb it's easy, easy to calculate, for many interactions easy. Anyway, that's what we do, okay? So in other words, your problem becomes an algebraic problem of diagonalizing the fog matrix in the basis set. Okay, that's all there is to it, really, using SCF uh, steps, okay? Uh, for nuclear physics, of course, you know, your basis function will be harmonic oscillator functions. That's the most common view, right? Uh, that is related to uh, properties of nuclei, uh, center of mass problems and so on. Okay, so, you know, so that's what you will do. In any case, you have known functions, and you are looking then for unknown coefficients d to represent these new orbitals. So in chemistry, if those would be atomic orbitals of atoms in a the molecule, then these are called 
LCAO coefficients. Okay, linear combination of atomic orbitals type coefficients, right? So this is the all kind of stuff you can do. All right. But you know, I'm talking about it not because yeah, I only want to show you how to solve hydrogen equation, but actually to learn more. Typically, a basis set has a lot more functions than the number of occupied spin orbitals. So if I have, say, hydrogen fluoride molecule, 10 electrons, then I'm not going to use a base set with 10 functions. That would be ridiculous. Right? I'm going to use a base set with maybe 100 functions. But if I have 100 functions, okay, then, of course, I have an opportunity to describe also unoccupied states. That is, after solving, you know, first we solve Hartford equations. After solving Hartford equations, okay, when you're done with convergence, you know what your fog operator is. Because, you know, you converge orbitals with it, so the fog operator is also converged. It's not just the orbitals, it's also the fog operator. The final fog operator, Actually, typically one performs one extra iteration to recompute the fog operator with the final set of orbitals. So it's to make sure, okay, then you have your fog operator. It's now determined. Well, then, once you have it, then what you do, you can now solve with this operator defined by your mean field, by your orbitals occupied in phi, you can solve an eigenvalue problem for the unoccupied orbitals. Okay? You can do it. If your base set is large enough, if it has more functions than the number of basis functions, so the number of electrons or fermions, then of course you can end, you can solve this problem in a much bigger space of your basis functions and obtain unoccupied states. Okay? How many? Well, the number of basis functions minus n. That's how many you can get. So if I use the, the example of hydrogen fluoride, 10 electrons, if I use a base set with 100 orbitals, that means 200 spin orbitals, okay, so 200 minus 10, that's 190 spin orbitals, which means again, divide by 2, 85, 95, 95 orbitals, which can span my unoccupied space. So you can see now that if I want to, and that is useful because that allows me now to construct correlated wave functions. When I start with a hard to fog determinant, and then I start producing singly, doubly, triply, and so on, excited determinants out of it, okay? So that's how uh, this goes. That's a very useful thing about Hartree Fock because you know instead of guessing orbitals and building, say, electronic or some other wave functions by some orbitals that are mathematical functions, you're actually trying to use optimum orbitals, optimize in some way. In this case, optimize by minimizing the the, the determinant energy, right? Uh, and then you build your correlated state out of those. Of course, that's not the only choice. But that's one of the choices which is extremely popular. I would say again, probably you know, 90% of the wave function calculations are based on RT4. Okay, because it's a standard way to do this. You have a question. What if you were to use these new orbitals as a new basis and uh, solve the RT4 equations again? You mean? So you have the yes. unoccupied orbitals now. Yeah. What do you? you oh, they were no, no. They were, they, they they don't know anything. You, you know, for RT4. Well, first of all, these are orthogonal to A. I. You have to remember, maybe I'll emphasize this. A, right. yeah. A's are orthogonal to I's. Okay, so they are not going to be useful to represent the I's. So if you just stick your A's back, you simply end up with uh, an eigenvalue problem back. Not, nothing new will come up. Okay, that is actually maybe, actually this is an interesting uh, thread to follow a little bit, because, you know, people also do the so-called numerical hard to form calculations. That's a minority, but it's an interesting minority. Okay, that is, instead of using basis functions, you solve particle equations on a grid. Each spin orbital, or each orbital, spatial part of it, is a function of x, y, z, so you can put, put some sort of point on a grid, and you can start solving it on a grid. Okay? Well, when you do that, you're never going to learn what the unoccupied space is. You see, because fog operator depends only on what's occupied in it, or what's occupied in the heart, in the terminal, right? That means that if you do numerical heart fog, it's going to be, of course, an infinite basis set calculation from the point of accuracy, but it will give you no access to unoccupied states because you never deal with them. Whereas when you use basis sets, if they are large enough, that is bigger than the number of fermions, then you get immediately access to unoccupied spin orbitals because after solving the hard to equation for the occupied ones, you know your fog operator, you can diagonalize it in the remain, you know, in your space, and you end up with higher eigenvalues and higher spin orbitals. Okay? So that's how this procedure works. 
I should mention in, in, in the end, uh, I'm not sure if I can say a lot about it, but let me say a little bit at least at the end now, namely this. So, you know, we have to be careful about talking about Hartree-Fock equations from a different point of view. That is, you know, I said that we were looking for the minimum, but I didn't find the minimum. I find that I found a stationary point. Okay? And now you have to realize a few things. First of all, Hartree-Fock equations, I said they are not an eigenvalue problem, wherever they are, they're not an eigenvalue problem, they are actually nonlinear equations, first of all. Something that you should really know or pay attention to. Most people don't, so it, I, you know, this is an opportunity for us to discuss it. Because the Fock operator is a function of our goals, so you have a phi's here and you have phi's here. It's quadratic in the phi, it's actually quadratic in the density matrix. But, well, you know, anything quadratic has nonlinear solutions, multiple solutions. And actually, you can study this aspect. We're not going to do this too much of it here, but, you know, but that's an aspect which is very interesting. So then you wonder, what are these other solutions? Okay? Well, some of them are kind of physical, but anyway, you end up with many solutions. So, of course, in hard hypothesis, you have to be prepared for being accidentally, for example, running, but, you know, it's a numerical procedure. It all depends on the initial guess. You may wind up in a solution you didn't look for. Okay? In some other solution of hard equations there, where you are not interested in finding it. Because it has multiple solutions by, because of its nonlinearity. Okay? And there is more to it. There is a famous problem that Perl of Levy described as the so called symmetry dilemma. You know, when you do these calculations, you, you know, we always have to think about the fact that our Hamiltonians have symmetries. Well, in nuclear physics, there are, there are plenty of symmetries in your Hamiltonian. In chemistry, at least, there's a spin symmetry. Quite often, if the molecule has some higher symmetry, you have a spatial symmetry. So, you, of course, you want to find solutions which are symmetry adapted. That means that you want to constrain, in the case of Hartree-Fock, your, your, your Hartree-Fock orbitals to, to be adapted to the symmetry. Okay? For example, if I know that my molecule is a closed shell molecule with S squared, where, where S squared commits with the Hamiltonian and SZ commits with the Hamiltonian, then, you know, I will be looking for S equals zero solutions, meaning that I will have you know, a closed shell situation, which we already discussed in this class. You know, where I'm putting two electrons on each orbital. Right? So I'm assuming that I have, say, n equal n over 2 spatial orbitals, and then I occupy each one of them by alpha and beta spins to maintain the S square symmetry. Okay? But do I have to do this? Mathematically, no. Nothing says in theory that you cannot assume that alpha orbitals, so this is what we call the restricted Hartree Fock. It's a calculation in which you are forcing that alpha and beta electrons sit in pairs on your spatial orbitals to preserve the spin symmetry. But of course, you don't have to do this. Mathematically, I can say that alpha orbitals are different than beta orbitals. Okay? I can allow the degree of freedom in my calculations. Okay? So I sort of can introduce some sort of a spin polarization. And then we are on the back ones. This is what we call an unrestricted artifact. What you are breaking here is the S square symmetry. Okay, so if this is S equals zero, this S is no longer zero, but SZ is still zero. Because I have the same number of alpha and beta orbitals. Uh, uh, right? So, or the same number of alpha and beta electrons, for example, if, if it's an electronic problem. So I have here a UHF. The question now, the dilemma comes from the fact, should I insist on symmetry, or should I let the symmetry go away and try to lower the energy by doing this. Because I lower the energy when I do this, typically. Not always, because sometimes you are already at the minimum here. You know, in your search that we performed, you may be at the minimum here. Okay? And simply you may try to assume that alpha and beta orbitals are different, but you are not going away from the minimum. Your, your, pro, pro, your calculation converges still to a situation where alpha and beta orbitals are the same. This is the problem of... Uh, triplet instability. So in other words, this is the situation where UHF is RHF. Okay, then we say that the solution is HF is triplet stable. Triplet because of triplet contamination in UHF. Okay? But quite often, by allowing the orbitals, alpha and beta orbitals to be different, you will produce UHF solution which is lower than RHF. Then you say that your RHF is no longer triplet stable. There is a lower energy solution for it. Okay? 
And you can continue, you know, in this sort of fashion, you can continue and go beyond. How about breaking more symmetries? You know, once you start breaking things, it's not too bad to break all of them, right? How about if I allow, I don't have even alpha and beta electrons. If I want to break symmetry, the SD symmetry, how do you do this? You form a combination of alpha and beta spins with some coefficients. Say A and D. Right? Create new spin functions. That sounds ridiculous, right? Because we're so used to the fact that there is a spin up and spin down function, but why not? Mathematically, I can do this. Okay, and then build determinants where instead of alpha and beta, we'll be having these kind of functions, mixtures of alpha and beta. When you do this, you break SZ. When you break SZ, you have a chance to lower your determinant, even energy of the determinant even further. Okay? So if you want to really find an absolute minimum, you would typically have to break all the symmetries you had. Okay? The same in your physics. There will be your deformed thing. In condensed matter, charge density waves. You know, all these kinds of things you know, are done simply by breaking symmetries. Okay? So please remember that and so in order to know whether your solution is the lowest energy solution or not, you have to check more than what we did in this class. And Joe Paulus in his notes writes a little bit about it. He actually, you know, Paulus and Cizek made tremendous contributions, not just to capacitor theory and things that we know, we often talk about, but actually they really, Aldous and Shizek and also Fukutomi in Japan, in the 60s, in the 70s, there was a lot of effort to actually analyze all these stabilities of artifact solutions. That is, what happens when I start breaking symmetries? And it's a fantastic area because by producing broken symmetries, you're lowering the energy, but you're breaking the symmetry. That's a symmetry dilemma. You want to insist on symmetry, but your solution may not be the lowest energy. You want to lower the energy, you might break the symmetries. Now you have to choose what's better. And why do we have this dilemma? Because we're dealing with an approximate wave function. Full CI never breaks anything. It's the best wave function, and it doesn't break any symmetry. But full CI is exact. Phi is not exact. So once you have something not exact, you have to violate always something. So you can. So that's what we are talking about. Here. Okay, so maybe I'll next class I'll start a little bit on this topic and then we'll continue to practice uh, maximum of our goals. Uh, I need your I hope I've done all that.